So last time we looked at your first season, season. of Dream Car Garage, which was 2000, mm -hmm. the Baldwin Motion Camaro. Yep. And you guys spread that across 13 episodes. And you alluded to Dale Earnhardt inviting you guys down in that episode, but I want this to be a standalone podcast. Right. So you got to tell that story. So this is season two. And you guys go down to DEI and spread that across your whole season. Shoot there for like a week. Right. Uh, so. Yeah. So how did that go, happen? We'll go back. So uh, in season one, we were doing the Baldwin motion car. And as that season was wrapping up, well, it was wrapped up already. Yeah. Um, oh, so it was, yeah, it was already airing. It was already airing. It right. had already finished the whole 13 episodes. Okay. And then uh, Dale Earnhardt came up to Oshawa to the plant, to the GM plant to do, I don't know, some sort of spiel. But was it for the, because he was running Daytona with Junior, would it have been for the C5R for Corvette Racing? So it would have been, uh, yes. 2001. So, so he'd already run s the C5R, but the Daytona 500 hadn't happened yet. Okay, so he was up for some GM thing. He was up for some GM thing. Okay. And he saw Tom because Tom was a journalist for the Toronto Star in the wheel section. And easily and, recognizable. And Tom's very <laughs> recognizable, absolutely. And larger than life. You wouldn't yeah. miss him. And uh, so Earnhardt comes up to him and says, hey, really like your TV show. Junior and I are doing a 69 Camaro. Uh, why don't you come down sometime? And Tom comes back and explains the whole thing. And I'm thinking he's full of shit. And he says, call him. And there he is. And he invites us down. So right. this is now the beginning of season two, and yeah. we just got invited to the biggest... Cup shop in the world. Biggest cup shop in the world and the biggest NASCAR... Uh, Personality. In history, right? probably. Right. Either Petty or him, one of the two. And at that point, he was certainly relevant far more than Petty. Right, he was still chasing champions. He was champion. still king. Yeah. 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 So... Uh, we uh, we get invited down, and we don't know what to expect. So you guys didn't plan anything? We didn't plan a thing. We didn't know what to do or, you know, what we were going to shoot or anything. We went down with Lestraco, yeah. uh, Chris, our sound guy, and that was it. And Tom and myself not having a clue what we were going to do. So let's, let's play a little bit of that. Okay. This season, we spent a little time in North Carolina with a race car driver who turned out to be a real car guy, and we wanted to share that with you. Well, Bill from Mooresville, North Carolina, sent us an email about his brand new, or new to him, 1957 Chevy. Well, we had an opportunity to visit Mooresville recently and got together with a guy who's got his own 57 Chevy. In fact, we can't almost stop him talking about it. Dale, good to see you again. Good to see you. We heard that uh, you put a new cylinder head on this thing. Well, I did. So you guys show up and... Like, is, is Dale Sr. kind of dictating, hey, let's shoot my 57 Chevy, let's... No, so we, we go into this showroom here, and it's got, you know, black granite floors and the whole bit, and it's the Taj Mahal. Right. So we just look at what's in the showroom, and then we're going to work off of what's in there. Right. Right. Uh, at this point, we don't know if we're getting to go into the back shop or anything yet. Okay. So the first car is you know, the coral pink 57 Chevy. And what was interesting is when we're getting set up in the in the showroom, we haven't met Dale yet. Yep. And what happens is there's this screwdriver under the hood of that Chevy. Of this pink of, one. Of this okay. pink one yeah. kind of sitting there. And you'll see later that he's tapping the screwdriver in his hand later. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think he was just putting us in our place and grabs the screwdriver, whips it across the granite floor, and just, who the fuck left this here? And we're like, whoa. So. What, he just wanted to make a, a little I bit I think of he was truly an intimidator, and I think he did it on the racetrack, and he did it with journalists and people he didn't know just to maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm just surmising, mm -hmm. but he sure had us on our heels instantly. Right. And then he asked us, he said, well, what are my lines? What do you want me to talk about? So he whips this screwdriver across the floor, and I think he's just, you You're know. Trying to set the tone? Well, set the tone that he's in charge. Yep. And 
then he asks us, what it, What are my lines? What do you want me to say? Because he's used to, I he, guess, like, yeah, like a scripted deal or, you right. know, doesn't know how it works. And, and so neither one of us know what the other wants. Right. Or is expecting. And uh, so we, we start off and say, just talk about the cars in here. The C5R, one of his Bush cars, the 57 Chevy, just talk about the cars. You know, what do you like? What don't you like? And he was kind of, it was very different that we were not a polished crew. Mm. We were a couple of guys, you know, that, you know, a couple of hillbillies out of Canada that didn't have a clue really what we were wanting to do. Right. Had nothing pre-planned and just winged it. Right. And I think he found it fascinating and it took a while for him to warm up to how we did things. Right. Well, let's continue on with the yep. opening here. So this is how you guys opened on this thing. Yeah. Well, I did. I, I bought this old car originally from uh, Texas, and it's a it's an original car. It's the original paint, original interior, original engine, six cylinder. I wanted to keep it all original, so uh, we went to tuning on it, just you know, brakes, a few little things, just to fix up on it a little bit, and found out it had a cracked head on it. It had a little miss in it. I couldn't get it out. It had a cracked little bit of water coming in it. So we changed the head. I rebuilt the carburetor. We did a little bit of a valve job on the head we put on. We found a 56 Chevrolet head. It had uh, 16,000 miles on the engine. Bought and got a good head and put it on. Same, just put it back as original as possible. But I just tinkered with this car for the last uh, couple months. Uh, went through the rear end, made sure it was good, put wheel bearings in it. Uh, did a new dry shaft. The dry shaft was warped in it. Had a vibration, couldn't get it out, so changed it. So it's just a neat old car. Love to drive it. It's uh, very relaxing to drive. Six cylinder, not much power, but she cruises good down the highway. I'll tell you, the first thing I noticed about it was all original, and it's nice to see that there's some guys left who want to leave them that way. <laughs> I mean, you can spend $100,000 working oh, on this car. You can yeah. cut a car up. And, and uh, talking about that, I, I do have a 57 Chevrolet I'm spending a lot of money on. I'm putting it on a, a chassis that's got Corvette suspension on it, putting a, a great engine in it, six-speed transmission. So we have got cars like that, but this is a, a unique car. It's all original, not been cut on or worked on or tore up. It's a, it's a neat car, automatic. Uh, it's a fun car to drive, enjoyable to ride around in. My 12-year-old my daughter loves riding around in this car. Uh, body paint, the paint's the original, the interior's original. So uh, I paid probably a little more, but it's a solid car, no rust, nothing under the car is wrong. I've, I've been all over the car, so it's a very presentable car, a good car to restore to its original uh, you know, luster. but. Uh, I, I enjoy it as it is, is just driving it stock. And, and, you know, the paint's a little worn on it. She's showing through in some places. But this old coral pink was a, a, a great color back in, in those days. Yeah, of all the years I've been watching you race, I never thought I'd ever see you wanted a pink car. Hey, Did I, they ever make you drive a pink I drove, car? I drove a pink race car the first year I started racing. So the first car I ever drove was a pink car. And I'm not going back to this because of that, but this is just a neat old car because it was original paint. And this was a great color back in 1957, the old coral pink. It really wasn't called pink, it was called curl, coral. Well, then, then it made it more manly for a guy. After all, you are the intimidator. You can't go around in a but pretty you, pink But you're car. talking about money, you know, of course, anything. You could spend a lot of money just putting, a, you know, different engine in this thing, souping up, paint job, tearing it apart, putting it back together. I know guys that's got well over 30000 in, in rest restoration jobs, and, and they're getting it. You know, they're trading cars and who's, selling. Who's Bill? What was that deal? That, that was just, uh, we'd get people sending in questions. Okay. So this Bill guy had sent in a question about 57 Chevy. And so that's how this this came about. We had that question, and then that guy was out of Mooresville. Right. So we we're kind of answering the question or letting Dale answer Was the, the shop question. in Mooresville? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, yep. huh. And did you guys really know what kind of a car guy Senior was? Didn't really have a clue. Yeah. And, and again, until we got there... Um, well, I guess other than that, he was already restoring a 69 Camaro. Correct. But With no junior. idea to what level he was no, restoring it. what extent. And Steve Crisp, who was kind of our liaison. Yeah, his right-hand guy, which really. Was, yeah, w was uh, uh, Dale's right-hand guy. Um, you know, he was a huge car guy and funny as hell. He was, he was another guy that was just hilarious. Hmm. Uh, but... Uh, um, he was the one telling us, and he helped help, you know, senior buy a bunch of the cars, okay, and looked for cars for him and stuff, and helped junior with the cars. He was really the gearhead, um, and I don't know if he got them into it, but he certainly helped transact most of their deals for him. Right? Did you guys 
did you think you were just, well, I guess you didn't really know. I was going to say, do you think that you were just going to get to go through the whole cup shop and look at everything and film that? We, we ended up going through the engine shop, uh, the dyno shop, um, you know, where they were setting up the cars. We, he, Steve took us around pretty much everywhere Mm -hmm. and we had, uh, an understanding with Steve that we would send him all the footage and if there was anything they didn't want seen, right, we wouldn't air it. Okay, yeah. So ever like the atmosphere was cool because yeah, they he were was really gonna... relaxed. That you know, if we caught something on camera they didn't want, they would just say, "Don't air that." And and it did happen actually right. in the end. Right. Okay. Yeah. So they did catch some stuff. Trading cars and selling cars all the time. Fifty seven Chevrolet hardtops is going for for way up in the thirties and forties. Bill's got a good project to start on here. He doesn't have to spend big money, though. He can kind of nickel and dime his way through it. He can, and I did that. I've done that with this car. Everything on this car is original, but I've tuned on it. I've did shocks. I've did brakes. Uh, New battery box frame, and you can go buy aftermarket things. Uh, The radio's original-looking radio, but it's an AM, FM. Looks stock. But I had the old one that came out and had it re- had it rebuilt and had it fixed, so it still plays. But I wanted an FM radio in it, but it looks stock. So you can tinker with these cars, tune on them, change this, change that. <laughs> I got a set of uh, a mag wheels on it, a different set of tires, try to make it ride a little smoother, but I still have the old stock pink wheels. <laughs> just like a car guy, just like the rest of us. Thanks for spending a little Thank time with Dream Car Garage. <laughs> Peter and Tom wanted to know what my dream car was. Well, this is it. It's, Ra- it's Corvette Racer. And the reason why is, is I've talked about running the 24 hour race for a lot of years in, in Daytona. And Chevrolet and the Corvette guys came up with this deal last year, really, but we couldn't put it together because of uh, my neck injuries. What was your impression of his enthusiasm for for sports car racing and endurance racing because that was really his like he did going. it his first go yeah he did it with junior yeah i think twofold one uh he really enjoyed sports car racing right uh i think he really got along great with ron fellows and right. fellows was involved in that whole fellows C-Tri-Bar. and uh, I, I forget the whole team but he was in the other car correct yeah but i think he helped him with you know turning well, right as well and Fellows also being a, a serious, uh, you know, road course ringer in NASCAR at the time. So Absolutely. Junior yeah. or senior had some respect for him. 100%. Right. And I think that they really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was, one, it was something new. You got to remember he was, I don't know, early 50s here. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. So he's, he's coming to the end of his NASCAR career. Yep. And I think he really enjoyed the road racing and the endurance racing, and he got to do it with Junior and got to do it with other really good road racers. So he was learning a bunch, too, from those guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, the, the, I think the car works so much better. I'd, and I'm just surmising. I don't know for sure, but I don't think he really ever ran anything other than stock cars. Right. So it would be like it would be a, a real treat to drive a car like that. Oh, it'd be like, wow, this is a great car. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to a stock car. Yeah. Yeah, because you see videos of whatever, 2000, well, you know, this is 2001, so 99, 2000, cars aren't working good around Sonoma and, and no, Watkins Glen. No, they're Glenn. rolling over and they're flopping around and, uh, you know, and, and really – they didn't have very many road races. Right, just two. So probably. a guy like Fellows could come in and, and you know, really put on a show. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So this is the car you guys made him pick, a dream car, modern dream right. car? And, and and out of all the cars, he said, this is the one I really like. And right. he did. So yep. being a true race car driver. Yeah, it's a race car. <laughs> did you did you tell him that your, uh, your first race car had the number three on it? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I left that to Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Tom would tell him a bunch of things. <laughs> I went down and tested the car, and uh, I've got a Corvette that I drive around the street, but it's nothing as fancy. The car looks good on the track. Get up and go, and also stop and turn as, as good as this race car does. And this is going to be a fun car to race in the 24-hour race, but uh, a fun car and a great memory for me. Uh, matter of fact, uh, might even build a street car just like this to play with on the street. But uh, this is, I think, uh, an ultimate dream car right here. Now you're talking about serious brakes. 
This baby's got serious brakes on it. It uses an AP brake uh, caliper, but it uses a big steel disc rotor just like a factory car has got on it. So it's a little bit larger. Now this thing will stop. It, unlike a Winston Cup car, we, we use a little bit smaller brakes on it. We've got good brakes, but not as much as this car has. Now you talk about motor. This car has got serious motor in it. It's around 625 horsepower, which, you know, a Winston Cup engine and a race engine has got around 720 to 740, a lot more than that. But you're talking about a serious restricted race motor. This engine is a little bit restricted. It's a 427 cubic inch uh, conversion engine, but we have to run a restrictor on it because of the class we're running in in, in the Daytona 24 hours. But uh, you're talking about torque. Now this thing has got a lot of low end torque. Uh, we used to Winston Cup cars, we're torquing up around 8,000 and shifting at 8,600. Maybe we revved to 9,000 at different times. But this thing, you're shifting at 6,200. Your max RPM's at 6,500. So you got a lot of low end torque. 3,000 RPM's up, that thing is a bear. So you got to be really careful on fresh tires or right out of the pits on fresh tires or cold tires or a cold racetrack. Got to be really careful, get those tires heated up and get going before you really stand on this baby. Stand on this baby too much too soon, you'll be around and around and in the infield. A lot of torque on this hood. You talking about a beautiful car. This is a beautiful car, but all this beauty translates into downforce. She's got tremendous downforce with the spoiler package on it and the front air dam and everything, the way it's built, the car is just tremendous on, on sticking to the racetrack. This car running 140, 50 mile an hour, you can absolutely jam on the brakes and it will not slide the tires because it has so much downforce. Tremendous downforce. Really, it runs good through the air, good downforce, good speed, good cornering capabilities because of the aerodynamics package. It looks great too. Uh, so to look this good. Guys collect these now. Big dollar cars. What do you think it's worth now? Million dollars, easy. Not a bad investment. No, no. Hmm. And, and that's you could if you still have to pay the two fifty. It, right, right. Yeah. Like you'd have a lot of fun driving that thing around the track. Still. Great car. Yeah. Seven years ago, when I first got bit by the race bug, I started out with a '66 Shelby Hertz car. So this is what everyone knows as the Deer Head Shop. Yeah. What is the Deer Head Shop? The Deer Head Shop was their first shop, really, and it was the Bush Shop. Okay. That they were doing the Bush cars out of, and obviously Dale was a huge hunter. Right, and you can see the walls just, you know, littered with deer heads, and um, you know he just loved the hunting. So that's um, I'm trying to think what segment we were doing here. Just play it through yeah. a little bit. Then an A production Corvette, and last year I did my first Trans Am race. But you know what my ultimate dream car is for a race mm -hmm. car? Is this number eight Bud Winston Cup car, Junior's car? You got Why don't you it. tell me a little about this thing, Dale? Well. The block is a steel block, just like we have in, a, in my 69 Camaro, aluminum intake, all the same kind of stuff you'll see under the hood of, hood of that car. Uh, we tweak it a little bit to get that 700 horsepower out of it and uh, makes a lot of power. What about the rear ends and the trannies? Well, the rear ends... Yeah, so you almost got to ask, like, Junior, what the story is on the, the deer head shop. Like, so it was their bush shop, and they just used it kind of as a showroom, or they were still running out of there? I think they were still running bush stuff, but I'm not I'm not sure exactly what they were doing with that. Right, because Junior Junior would have been running uh, I, before this, because this is one of his early Cup seasons. Call right. it right. He would have been running bush for DEI. Yeah, right. That's a iconic shop. Yep. Trans actually a four nine inch rear end. Uh, with NASCAR rules, everybody has to run the same thing. The transmission is a T ten. So. It's, uh, it's all... So what, what was it like? Um, you said, okay, now we're going to do a segment, or someone suggested we do a segment on the Budweiser car, on yeah. Junior's car, and you said, okay, that's a cool car. Right. Current cup car. And then Steve or Senior said, introduced you to Junior and said, here, you do the segment with him? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So Steve Crisp kind of was... Uh, you know, looked after Junior, especially in the early days. Right. And that and just uh, made sure that he was new to Cup and new to, to the... Uh, to all the, the media deal. stuff. All the media stuff just made sure that, you know, he was coming across the way he should. Right. Yeah. Okay. So he, yeah, he was going to tell you about his Cup car. Yeah. Transmission is a T10. So it's, uh, it's all standard stuff that, that that's been in Chevrolets and Fords over the past 50 years it's all just been beefed up for the 500 miles we run and what's one of these things weigh about 3400 pounds without the driver 3700 pounds with Tom stuffed in the trunk 
Now these Monte Carlos, they're pretty slick. They're a real aerodynamic. Tell us about it. We spend a lot of time in the wind tunnel trying to tweak each corner of the car to get the air to go around the car the fastest. Also trying to get air on the spoiler and the nose of the car to get the most downforce. Now I've seen you tear the whole side off one of these cars. How does that affect it? Well, one time at Daytona <laughs> we had to see post collapse and that cost four tenths of laps. So that's how big aero is. What's the single most important thing to make these things fly? Well, I think the most important thing is whose name you got on the roof. Good answer. I'm not ready to have my name on the roof, but what do I got to do to jump in this car? Hmm. Well, I do need a trunk rubber in my 69 Camaro. Done. All right. If you're going to do this, though, you got to be cool. Stay on the compound because we don't want to get in any trouble. Anything I need to know? Well, it's just like a stock Monte Carlo. They do call them stock cars, dude. There's some of Junior's guys doing a pit stop. So they, <laughs> you got to drive his, like a show car or something? Yeah, it, was, it was, wasn't the full-on race car, obviously, that they're going to race that weekend. Yep. But it was one of their show cars, and they had, I don't know, like a 500-horsepower motor in it or whatever. But it still had uh, a Jericho or whatever they were on, NT-101s or whatever it was back then. Transmission, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, we'd like to have fun with it. And this was when Steve Crisp was a really funny guy. And we all talked about, you know, how to make it more interesting than just driving around the parking lot. Right. And that's when Chris came up with the idea. He says, well, let's pretend you go off the... And we did. We went across the road and that... Right, because Junior said, stay on the compound. Right, stay on the compound. He says, let's pretend you, you know, you abandon that idea and just go on the road. And the cops are going to pull you over. And, of course, all the cops in Mooresville, you know, knew... Earnhardt's of course yeah. so so Steve calls him up and says hey we need you for a few minutes to do a little segment and then we just kind of came up with this idea to do this segment and it just morphed into you know driving the car and getting arrested and the whole bit right because yeah. in practice well we'll play it here that's yeah. good you know what I think they're gonna hang a Yui and try and get some new skins for this did these guys know oh yeah okay I guess, yeah. Junior says you can put a fresh set of good ears on this. I think we're going to put you in a trunk with Tom. We're trying to practice here. You need to keep moving. <laughs> you know, the interior of these are pretty plain. All you get is a steering wheel, a seat, a shifter, and a couple of gauges. Where's the air conditioning? Power windows. You got a clutch on it. You don't pop it and spin the wheels. You're just going to stall the thing. And look at this. Drive up to a stop sign. There's not even a turn signal on this thing. I think I'm going to get in trouble on the road with this thing. You know what's great about these cars? They've got a little club that gets together every Sunday afternoon, and they actually rent the track and go around the track. And you know what? They're getting 80 to 120,000 people watching them every Sunday. Can you imagine that? Who came up with those lines? That's pretty good. <laughs> you know, there's a little club they have every weekend. <laughs> Everyone takes these cars we're, out. We were taking it as as we weren't into stock car racing, right? You know, so we're just the whole thing was just a goof. Yeah. yeah. I think these cars are really going to go up in value with that sort of enthusiasm for them when they're brand new. What are they going to be like when they're 20 years old? Well, I'm going to take this thing out on the open road and see what she really does. Please, <laughs> Chase. <laughs> got their dash cam for Oh, it. yeah, we had the dash cam on. These guys were awesome. Good afternoon, sir. How you doing? Uh, good. How about you? Fine. Do you know why I stopped you? I figured you heard we were sponsored by Country Style Donuts. Thought maybe we had some in the trunk. No, sir. The reason I stopped you is because in North Carolina, <laughs> when you drive a race car on the roads, you must first have a safety net up. You must be wearing a helmet. And third of all, I don't see your spotter anywhere around. Have you got your driver license registration in hand? No, sir, I don't. Okay, if you would, how about step out of the vehicle for me? All right. Oh. I don't know how they call these things stock cars. They don't even have doors. 
Sir, if you would just put your hands on the hood right here, please. You know what? <laughs> it's a good <laughs> shot. For a race car, I can't believe how nice the paint is on this thing. Sir, this is what happens when you pass the pace car. Hey, you're Dennis Gage. I'm not Dennis Gage. I'm Peter Clute from Dream Car Garage. You're not Peter from Dream Car Garage. I watched that show. Watch your head, Mr. Gage. <laughs> 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 what sh what show was Dennis so Gage? Dennis Gage is the guy with the mustache. Right. He's been Was it my he, classic car? My classic car. Yeah. So he'd been he was the big guy at the time and we were in season two. So right. we were kind of the new guys on the block mm. on speed or speed vision at the time. Yep. So we just had fun with the whole thing. And the guys, the cops were awesome. Oh, they're great. Yeah. Steve was great. Earnhardt's were like awesome. They let us do kind of just goofing around goofing at the race shop. <laughs> at the race shop. And that's why we all just were pretty relaxed about it. And I think that first um, first day that we were there, I think we were there for three days. Mm. The first day just broke the ice. And uh, that one segment where after Tom gets um, senior to do that one segment with the 57 Chevy, mm -hmm. and just out of the blue, he says to Earnhardt, now that I got you on tape, you can kiss my ass. Well, he can kiss my ass now because I got it on tape. <laughs> I think Earnhardt just thought, wow, these are normal guys. Like, they don't, they no, don't they, care. They don't care. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm sure he would have been, like, the majority of his interactions at that point People would have been tiptoeing around. He's the intimidator, kissing his ass, and yep. you know Tom's telling him to, to, to <laughs> kiss, kiss his, his ass. ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then uh, Earnhardt called him Nacho instead of Nacho. Right, you know, says, Nacho, you're okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. You know, for a new car, the thing really gets up and goes. Some of the interior options, well, that leaves a little bit to desire. But to replace this car, I mean, to rebuild it from scratch, it's going to cost you at least $200,000. Well, yeah, that's a wrap on another episode of Dream time. Car Garage. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, I want to tell you how warm and rich the North Carolina hospitality has been since we've been here. So you guys had an Ask the Pro segment where you did work on just any car, like a little tip? Yeah, it was just basically a pro tip on what to do with, uh, you know, installing a trunk rubber like this one for junior right did yeah. he so he said it in, i guess he said it in the other clip did he actually need a trunk rubber he did okay he did, like they were putting a trunk rubber in so he was working on this he what was work that was the car that he and senior were working on the season before so this is the 69 camaro this is the 69 camaro okay so yeah. not yeah. restored to original more of a resto mod more of a had resto a, mod had a cool motor in it and everything yeah. okay and so, so Junior had you do the trunk rubber. Right. And Junior had a like, great sense of humor, too. Right. He's, he's just ripping on me here, too. <laughs> trunk thing leaks like a sieve, but they all do. And it looks like he's got one wicked system in this thing. And if it gets wet, he's probably going to blow about 10 grand. So what you got to do first is rip out the old trunk rubber. That's pretty easy to do. The next thing you need to do is vacuum out all the old dirt. Once you're finishing the vacuum, you got to degrease that whole area. Man, let's take a salon here. <laughs> you here to help or to eat? Man, a deal's a deal. Get to work. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that all of this stuff here is really clean because if you're going to put the, uh, the weather strip adhesive on and it's dirty, it just isn't going to stick. Man, I'll tell you what. Ask for a trunk rubber, not a whole restoration. <laughs> you know, I think we're going to have to vacuum this thing again. Dude, we're going to Mooresville. We're not going to Pebble Beach. <laughs> What's that? I said we're going to Mooresville, not Pebble Beach. Well, I can see why it leaked last time. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're taking our time. Huh? <laughs> All right. Next thing we got to do is put some weather strip adhesive on both surfaces. So we got to start with the car and then the weather strip. All right. Now I really do need your help. You know, normally after you let this set up, it's ready to go in. Normally we'd take the trunk lid off this thing, but Junior here is in a rush. <laughs> yeah, that's the right way to do it. We got somewhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go. <laughs> the 
All right, once you get the rest of that trunk rubber in place, the last thing you got to do is slice it. Yeah, we got some engineers if you need some help. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're in a rush, but we got to wipe up that axle. Oh, most definitely. You know, can't have a mess there. All right, man, deal's a deal. I'm pretty impressed, man, good job. Here we go, Rod. Absolutely, let's go. What's this thing here? That's a little TV monitor for GPS. No kidding, huh? Yeah. You get lost often? No, not really, but we take long trips. <laughs> <laughs> you get lost often. So was, you, this was obviously part of the segment you guys talked about, that you were going right. to go for a drive. and Go for a drive afterwards, yeah. And what was, I guess, how old was Junior? Probably in his early 20s at that time? Maybe yeah. something like that? Yeah. What was your impression of him compared to Senior? Like, totally a different guy. Senior had a really good sense of humor, too. Mm. But I think he was just way more reserved. Junior was, like, he was, he knew he was going to be the king of the world soon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was winning races. Like, he was, he was the guy right and uh had a great sense of humor he was young and, and just fun i think he had a he was enjoying life right <laughs> he was right. having a good time with everything <laughs> cruising around in the, yeah 69 camaro here yeah. and wheeling around like oh yeah driving it time. pretty good yeah. yeah what'd you do to the motor in this thing Hawk. well we just uh <laughs> i had it worked on by a buddy of mine it's 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 a standard like it's like a Aluminum head Corvette motor and uh, puts out a lot of power. I mean, the transmission and the 373 gear really helped it a lot. We, we put a nice little package underneath for, uh, for handling. I love the transmission, just like a race car. High performance. <laughs> now, what else did you do to this thing here? You got suspension done? What'd you do there? Well, we just put all new bushings in it, put some bigger sway bars in it to get some of the roll out of the car. Uh, put, put some uh, new release springs from the, like, probably uh, an 80s model Z28. And, you guys uh, listening to tunes in there? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to handle a little bit better. It's got the low profile tires on it. it took a little bit away from the handle of the car, so we, we kind of helped it out with some of, the, some of the sway bars and whatnot. Now, what about the uh, change in the motor? I know when I did my first Shelby, it was a numbers match piece. And I caught a whole ton of grief for pulling the original motor out, caging it, and doing all that stuff. You getting that too? Well, you can't do this with an original loader. I mean, I just, I wanted a car that would haul butt. And uh, I have some, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the car for a while when it had original rubbers. And I kept all that stuff, and I can always put it back, but I'm 26 years old. I want to go fast and where I go. There you go, 26. Hmm. So, what was your impression of the shop compared to, I guess, what you thought it would be going to a race shop? Was like, did it meet your expectations? Was Way it, beyond. Okay. I mean, the um, you think of stock car racing, and I had never been to a a, a cup race. Uh, well, or, or a, a cup shop or right. any big race shop yeah. at that point. And uh, going there was an eye opener compared mm -hmm. to restoration shops that I'd been to. Which are kind of typically dirty. Yeah, they're body shops. Body right? shops, right. Yeah. Body shops. So yeah. a race shop, I mean, the floors were epoxied or granite. And Earnhardt, the original. Uh, showroom there was supposed to be one of the setup shops. There was still a surface plate in the middle of a granite floor, and the guys are going, you know, we can't work on granite floors type thing. Really? Yeah. That so he built he built the shop with a granite floor, and they were going to do setup on the granite floor. Well, the the surface plate was built into the floor. Really? Yeah. So then they made that the showroom. They made that the showroom, but everything was just spotlessly clean, mm. and everything was brand new. Um, you know, the equipment, the carts, the uh, CNC, you know, uh, centers, uh, the dynos, where everything was brand new. It was it was spectacular. The building was spectacular. Uh, I don't know, it's probably 100,000 feet or maybe more in different shops for different things. And I, I remember, I think they had three engine dynos in this, you know, 
climate controlled environment. And he, they were telling us at the time for the restrictor plate motors. Right. Cause they were the Kings of they restrictor were plate racing. King of restrictor plate racing at that point that, uh, if they found two horsepower in the head, they would scrap all the old ones and everybody would go to the new head. And then it was that guy's, you know, job to find another two horsepower. Um, you know, they had, they had drive shaft dynos, which we couldn't put on the show. Right. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd shot it. They had, they, I mean, they were testing everything. They were leaving nothing to chance. It was, um, sort of uh, primitive technology, but taking to an extreme. Right. Uh, compared to, like, if you take supercars at the time, I mean, obviously they weren't fuel injected. They were just four-speed gearboxes, you know, a nine-inch that's been around forever. Mm -hmm. But they were they were making the stuff unbelievably good. And obviously the last, like, the, you, you heard uh, Senior talk about the RPM they were running back then. That was 20 years ago. They were running 9,000 RPM yeah. for three hours, four right. hours, 500 miles. Mm -hmm. How much did, like, really seeing that operation open your eyes? Because you, you had just started your season of Trans Am racing, sports car racing. How much did seeing that operation open your eyes to, like, how serious guys take racing and how like how much effort can be put behind racing. Did you really appreciate how much w effort was put behind cup racing at least? Uh, I, d I didn't until after I'd been there. Right. Yeah. Right. And I mean, those guys were on the top of their game mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, but they were, it, it was way more than I ever expected. Right. Yeah. Now I know because at the same time, or the year after you were building this shop that we're in right now. Right. How much did DEI influence your build of this shop? A lot. In the sense of, you know, having compartmentalized the shop. So, you know, we have the assembly side, we have the mechanical side, we have the body shop, we have the, uh, you know, the fab shop, the race shop, the cleanup shop, and then the metal shop. Um, so, and that's what they did. They had, everything had, you know, a separate sort of room or, or area to work in. Right. And uh, I think that was, that was a big part of it. And then just everything had to be epoxy. The floors were all epoxied here. Um, you know, put good lighting in, you know, painted all the walls and tried to make a restoration shop that looked more like a race shop mm. than a re traditional restoration shop. Right, with just a poured floor and, yeah. Yeah, th I mean, it, it, most shops back then had a concrete floor and, you know, the concrete block walls or whatever was there and that was it. Nobody nobody was doing epoxy floors in a body shop at that point. Right. Right. How was, I guess, you? so you guys were there for three days and you kind of hung out on and off with, well, junior and senior, really. Mm -hmm. How was it? kind of left with with senior uh so in that deer head shop that we did that one segment out of that the last night we were there senior was locking up and he lived behind the place or you know close by mm -hmm. and he was locking the doors of this compound and uh we we're in the deer head shop packing up our stuff and it was nine at night or whatever and um Lestraco was big into hunting. He was doing yeah, hunting camera shows guy, at yeah. the time. The cameraman. Oh, so they must have been talking. So about they were it. talking about the hunting and the deer head shop. And, you know, he's handing us all a beer and we're just drinking beers and just shooting the shit. And uh, after we left that night, he liked the fact that we weren't scripted. We weren't polished. We were just. Right. He knew you guys didn't have an angle on him. There was no angle. Right. It was, it, we thought it was cool. We liked cars. He liked cars. We liked racing. He obviously is the king of racing. Yeah. Um, and, and we weren't like neither one of us, Tom or myself or Lestrac or, or Chris, the camera guy or the uh, sound guy, none of us were really into stock car racing at all. Right. So it must've almost been refreshing compared to like super fans. Right. Yeah. Like, 
we didn't know who all the guys were or what the teams were or anything. We were, you know, we were car guys doing car TV, not mm. racers. We, both Tom and I had raced a little bit. Right. But it was just purely for fun. Right. You know. Right. So, yeah, he got this whole, he got to express himself completely as a car guy as opposed to a racer. Correct. Yeah. yeah big difference there. Right. And most interviews would want to talk to him about the season, know, the, the season or the car or, you know, the crash last weekend or who took out who or, you know, the, the drama of NASCAR. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, we, we barely, we barely touched on stock cars other than that. You know, making fun of it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which they must have thought these guys are idiots. Like, yep. yeah, yeah, we have this little event every weekend. You know, a hundred thousand people show up. Imagine right. that. So, so we were just goofing on the whole thing, huh? Yeah. So, talking to Lestraco and like you guys, you guys have a pretty cool sit down interview of Senior, uh, where he's just completely candid yep. talking about life yeah tom had just finished shooting a segment with him and they were in front of that 57 chevy and the cameras were still rolling tom still had his mic on and senior still had his mic on and uh and uh i was just by a ladder and lestraco just had the camera rolling on the tripod mm -hmm. and they start talking and we're just shooting the shit and then he just loosens right up and he starts talking about him learning to drive, uh, doing his first race with that pink car, uh, you know, how that came about, um, you know, his father putting him on his lap to teach him how to drive and then he goes on about talking about bringing kids up properly, teaching them right and then, mm. you know, it went from you know, teaching them how to drive a car to teaching them to learn, uh, you know, teaching them to go to church on Sundays and uh, teaching them about guns and just everything uh, to do with how your kids should be brought up, hmm. which was kind of him very much unplugged. Right. And then he talks about uh, uh, his daughter turning 12 and he bought her a car for her birth year and <clears throat> her having a dream that night before she knew she was even getting the car and telling Teresa, the you know, uh, senior's wife and yeah. the daughter's yeah. mom, yeah, um, you know, I had a dream that I was getting a car. And she huh. was. And she got the car that night. Wow. So it's just kind of ironic. And then uh, when we finished that, I don't know, it was 10 or 15 minutes with him just shooting the shit. Yeah. Steve Crisp came up to us and said, you just got an interview with him that nobody's ever gotten. And before we, well, as we were driving home, he called us up and said, I want to, I want to do, I want to have you guys host a shop tour. Okay. S so what he wanted us to do was, you know, for their um, merchandise machine. Yep. Do, you know, Dream Car Garage guys tour of DEI. And as us making fun of it, having so a, it would have been a time. goofy shop. It would have been a goofy shop tour. Yeah, and uh, I I forget what the number was, but he told us and he says, you know, he says it's seventy five grand enough to do it, and we're like, well, yeah, it's more than enough to do it. Yeah, and, and we would have done it for free because it was great, and I mean, it helped having Earnhardt on there on their second season just helped launch us, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, to a different world again, just because he was king, right. So your show must have had a huge amount of viewership anyways just because of the car culture in the Carolinas, in the Southeast. For sure. But having Earnhardt on, on and kind of spreading it, um, spreading it out over the whole season, mm. so he was, he was on a fair bet, right. was great for us. Right. Yeah. So after that, Steve says, hey, you guys got an interview with Earnhardt that no one's ever got, and you just don't really think anything of it, I assume? Right, because we haven't edited any of this yet. Right. So all we have is raw footage now. Yep. And before we get home, uh, Senior asked us if we would do this shop tour. Yeah. Which we're like, for sure. You guys haven't edited anything two weeks after you get the news that he died. 
Right. We what? were we were watching the race because now we had an interest. We weren't right. You knew the guys. We weren't NASCAR fans, and we're literally watching the race, going, "Holy cow! They're going to finish like you know first, second, and wherever senior finishes because it was uh, junior and wall trip." Right. And you know, and we're you know cheering for your buddies cheering now for the guys that we we just got to meet Mm -hmm. and by the end of the day he's he's gone yeah huh what was that like what was that like i mean the next time you guys got together to film and talked about it so or or it wasn't long afterward because we we did have to get some of the shows out yeah so i talked to steve crisp and called Steve up maybe a, a week or probably a week after he died and said to Steve, you know, what do you want us to do with this? Right. And he was he was a little snarky at first. He says, you know, do whatever you want with it. Big E signed off on it. And I said, no, like, tell us what you want us to do because we don't make our living, you know, doing TV. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I wouldn't want to disrespect to disrespect yeah. anything. You guys were just awesome. So we went through the footage, and he said, "This one's good. This one's good. This one's good." And then we had that interview that you know was kind of relevant now, or oh, it would have been huge for people huge. to see. So I said to to Steve, "What do you want us to do with that?" And he says, "Put it in the can until one of us says it's good to go. Just leave it there." And right. we did. Hmm. So we never put that footage out there. Um, so we only put out what they approved and we got invited back. Teresa invited us back and then we did stuff with Waltrip and, uh, junior and, uh, who was the other guy? Then? Steve parks park. I forget who it was that took the, uh, Pennzoil car. Um, but, uh, so, so after he passed away, you guys got invited back by Teresa. And the shot next, some more. The next year. And shot some more stuff. Yeah, with, with wall trip. Right. Um, and just kind of, uh, I believe we had Teresa on that year. Um, and it was, it, it was obviously really different. Yeah. Yep. But, um, and Steve Crisp then ended up going to. Uh, Hendrix? Well, th- not yet. He, d- he did end up at Hendrix. But he went, so uh, Junior broke off kind of and did the, the the Bush thing himself. He had a Bush team as well as then driving for DEI. Yep. So Steve kind of went with Junior. Right. And then when Junior went to Hendrick, Steve went with him to Hendrick as well. Right. Yeah. Huh. So did you guys... And maybe it's tough to say, but did you guys envision kind of this long relationship doing stuff every year with Earnhardt or doing bits in here and there? And I would have liked to have thought that that would have went on. And we ended up doing, we we ended up having a great relationship with um, Hendrick because Junior went there and we kind of got that introduction through Steve Crisp. Okay. We got an introduction to the NASCAR world. Right. Through the right guy. Through the right guy. And we didn't do anything stupid. Like we, you know, we had some really cool footage that would have been interesting, especially at the time Mm. when all the, you know, the bullshit of autopsy photos and all the like stupidity of, you know, the, the media, the media that just went haywire there. Um, we just put it in the can and said, we'll leave it there. Right. Yep. Huh? Well, that's probably a good spot to end it. Maybe we'll uh, well we'll look at season three, and yep. find some cool <laughs> stuff for the the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Now at this time, were you guys a lot more comfortable on camera, or you at least by the time you I, went down to Earnhardt Shop? A little bit. What was what was interesting is when somebody like Junior was goofing on me, it was easy to kind of goof back a little bit. Right. And and I think. Uh, it just, and then we're doing stupid stuff like that skit driving the car and the cops coming. It it just became easier. Right. When there's, when it's not as serious, it's easier, right? It is. Yeah. It is. 
You know, you're not trying to, oh, what are the numbers of this thing and how many of these were built? And, you know, and people would, you know, if you said there was 350 built and there was 349, people would email you in. You, you know, you're you got idiot. it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So when you're goofing and having fun, then it's easier. It made it easier. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's good. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs>